gears a little bit here and talk about mutations for a moment. In the summer of 2011, I started noticing mutations in my area of the country, in the Midwest, and I began to photograph them and then put out a call to our listeners to start sending in images to us that we could share with Loren and other researchers, make them publicly accessible, and we were just inundated with hundreds and hundreds of very strange, very unusual genetic defects that were being expressed, especially in things that grow fast and uptake a lot of water, like weeds, young trees, and produce. And I am actually comprising a CD for Loren for all of the images through 2012, now that the growing season is over. It's beginning. <laughs> <laughs> for me, I've been out in my garden all day today. Yeah. And this, this is something that we will continue to contribute to as time goes on. Loren, have you had a chance to review any of those images, and what did you think when you saw them? Well, first of all, I would like to really thank you, thank the you and the listeners particularly for uh, providing this critical information because basically it's the only information we're getting. Um, and it's very, very telling. We can, you know, we have images of those uh, radiation impacts now and we will continue to collect them. But, you know, basically it's kind of a family affair and I, I feel like you and I and some of the other researchers that we know and work with are um, part of a family. And it's wonderful to have other people join the family, uh, providing us with this information and interest in resources, all kinds of things, all kinds of surprises. Um, it's actually a really, really wonderful process. Uh, for a very tragic thing. And that's what has to happen. We have to all come together and share information and be vigilant about uh, reporting what our government, governments all over the world are not reporting. Of course, that's what happened after Chernobyl uh, also. So it's no surprise. Uh, but we're the ones who are going to find the solutions. We're going to... Um, do what our governments won't do to um, to change change it to learn more, and it's exactly what happened in Hiroshima, and Nagasaki, uh, after the bombs were dropped in World War II. The U.S. government completely covered it up. They wouldn't let Americans know about it because they wanted a nuclear weapons program, and it was the ingen ingenuity of the Japanese medical professionals and other unsung heroes who helped to save the lives and to um, to discover new ways to treat these poor victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the doctors had no blood. They couldn't give transfusions. They had no medical supplies. After a while, they ran out very quickly. And they had no support from their government and from the U.S. government. So what these doctors did was they took seaweed and they extracted the juice, which is basically like seawater, very similar to seawater, and our blood is a replacement for the seawater that we lived in before we evolved into uh, human beings or when, when life left the oceans and went up onto the continents. And so they gave transfusions to the bombing victims with um, seaweed juice. That's what they injected into their veins, and they kept them alive. And there, there were many other things, that good things that came out of it, medical things that they learned. And uh, so a lot of really good things are going to come out of this, uh, new understandings about medicine and health and trace elements and all kinds of stuff. Uh, people shouldn't be uh, dismayed or, or hopeless or anything. We have to keep our spiritual energy at a high level because this is spiritual warfare. 
and our spirits are the are much mightier than any military or army. It's spirituality that always counters the dark energy, and this is one of the darkest times in uh, the history of humanity. So um, please, 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 please join this family. Please bring your good spirit. Please bring what you have, resources, whatever you have. And I don't mean money. Money, of course, is necessary, but there are a lot of things that money simply can't buy. And those things a lot of times have much greater value than money. So I just really want to thank you, Christina, and your listeners and people who have provided you with so much out of their own concerns. Now, none of this is new. The harmful effects in terms of causing mutations, the mutagenic effects of ionizing radiation were known before 1920. And a very, very wonderful, very, very dedicated, uh, very honest man, uh, Dr. Mueller in the United States, began studying the effects of x-rays on uh, fruit flies. And fruit flies, the Latin name is um, Drosophila melanogaster. They have a very, very short life cycle, so you can expose a fruit fly or a group of fruit flies and watch them over many, many generations that would be impossible to do with human beings or other animals. And what he discovered before 1920 is that when you expose a male fruit fly to x-rays and damage the sperm, the DNA, the genetic material in the sperm, the, um, he bred them with undamaged, unexposed female fruit flies. And that the damage in the sperm, in the DNA of the male, was actually passed on to all future generations. This is for thousands of generations that he studied from before 1920 all the way into the 50s and 60s, almost uh, probably 60 or 70 years he did those studies. And uh, he said that he reported that the effects uh, are permanent, They are unpredictable in how they are um, expressed. Uh, They are expressed in all future generations, but in different ways. And expression might skip generations, but the damage is still there. And in 1946, he won the Nobel Prize in medicine and or biology for his discoveries before 1920. So... That indicates that the people behind these technologies um, proliferating all this this radiation all over the world and mixing it with chemicals and everything uh, are very aware of those studies because they used them. (laughs) They used his data and his information to actually turn around, turn it around, and weaponized it to use on humanity. And there are many, many indications of that, including uh, the talks that Bertrand Russell, the most dangerous man in the 20th century, gave at Oxford in the 30s. And he said we were going to do this. He said we're going to sterilize 95% of the males and 60% of the females. And the 40% of females and 5% of males that are left who are fertile will be bred to produce Cannon fodder for our wars. Bertrand Russell was part of the New World Order. They were planning this a century ago. They just didn't have the technology. And so what we're seeing today as a, as a result of Fukushima, and you started collecting data right away, is that the, um, it's affecting fertility, It's affecting uh, embryos and fetuses. This is in plants, in animals, and in human beings. And when it's in animals and plants and human beings, it's got to be an environmental 
influence or toxin or whatever way you want to call it. And in uh, you, you had pictures of um, kittens that were born deformed, and we will go on and um, you you can you can tell people um, about what you have collected. I wanted to just say a couple things about what um, was discovered in Japan. And uh, there were uh, Japanese scientists wandering around, around Fukushima Prefecture not long after the, um, the Fukushima disaster. Uh, one, there, were, there were field samples collected in September of 2011 and before that by scientists. One of them was Joji Otaki, who collected the pale grass blue butterflies the size of a silver dollar. And he reported that uh, there were many abnormal patterns in the dark dots on their wings. And he also noticed dents in their eyes. They have compound eyes and very strangely shaped wings and legs. He's a professor at the University of the Ryukyus in Okinawa. I have spoken there. And he was in the Abukuma Mountains, west of the disaster area. He also found in the first generation uh, that the abnormalities, the, the, the defects were uh, within normal boundaries. But when he kept breeding these butterflies, like Mueller did in his laboratory, mutations in the offspring of that first generation increased to 18%. These were then inherited genetic damage. Then he collected more in September of 2011, uh, which represented the fourth or fifth generations of those butterflies, just as Mueller did. And they had even higher abnormality rates. Uh, they found other an uh, deformities in the antenna legs and other body parts that are extremely unusual. This was a comment by uh, the Hokkaido University entomologist Shinichi Akimoto, who was studying the impact of Fukushima fallout on aphids. These are insects, he said, that are commonly assumed to be more resistant to radiation to, than humans. But now we know from Fukushima that they are not even changing just individual species. Dr. Mori reported defects uh, in plant material. So he went out and collected ferns, and he collected the uh, cypress trees and the, the uh, reproductive bodies or organs on the branches. And he also collected... Um, what else did he collect? Um, oh, he even collected birds. And he laid these on pieces of radiation-sensitive paper. Uh, he probably refrigerated them because it took a month to get a, a radiograph of some of them. And in the ferns, you could see it was in the, um, the stomata, the things they breathe through on the leaves that had the highest radiation contamination. In the birds, it was in the uh, material they had eaten, like insects and, and leaves, plant material, that was in their stomachs. The dust on their wings and the food in their stomachs had the highest uh, contamination levels in the birds. And the strangest thing of all, was on the cypress trees, and this is exactly what's happening in the human population. The um, Normally, in cypress trees, all of the female organs are on, the, on one branch, and the male reproductive organs are on the, the, a, a, a different branch. They're not found on the same branches. When he went out and collected these cypress trees after Fukushima, he discovered the males and the females were mixed up now on the same branches. And so there were female reproductive structures that were growing out of the male reproductive structures, and it was all mixed up. This is called intersex. 
It's when both sexes are found in one organism when there should only be one. It should be male or female. And now it's happening in human beings. We're seeing um, there's a very large increase in hermaphrodites, and these are humans with male and female reproductive cells in their tissues. Now I'm reading all the time about babies, and uh, in Japan they just kill all the abnormal babies. They abort them, or they're born, and they just tell the mother that it di- the, the baby died, and they're not allowed to see them because they are hiding the birth defects. In the U.S., they're doing the same thing. And when you have intersex expressed in the human population, and in animals, the birds, and in fish, and in plants, then it has to be an environmental cause. So those were some of the early studies uh, the Japanese scientists reported, and I've been to the, the Japanese Scientific Association in Tokyo to one of their meetings. Uh, there were two women and 500 men. And um, they are very, very excellent scientists. They've been extremely courageous, just as the Japanese medical people were after uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And um, it's always been a great pleasure to work with them. And um, it's pretty hard to find scientists to work with here in the U.S. because they're afraid of losing their jobs. The effects uh, from the the radiation exposure... uh, in Japan, very similar to the effects here that are being reported, and uh, very similar, same effects that Yablokov reported after Chernobyl in Russia. Well, Loren, when we're when we're talking about all these things that read at this increased rate, like the butterflies and the and the fruit flies and so forth, is it safe to assume at this point because it will be decades, if not centuries, where the um, human gem- generations would catch up to this or be able to analyze this, that if it's happening in the plants and the butterflies and in the fish and all these things, that it's happening in humans too, especially when Dr. Mueller's research had indicated all the way back in 1920 that for every birth defect that is expressed externally, there are 10 more internally that don't show up until subsequent generations. That's correct. And, um, so at Christmas time, now I was really shocked at Christmas time. I was walking up and down the sidewalks and, you know, families and mothers and children and babies were out shopping for Christmas. So people you don't normally see were out on the streets and on the buses. And, uh, Christina, I was really horrified because I saw children, babies. These are all babies born a- after Fukushima with, um, uh, birth defects uh, of the eyes that indicates uh, exposure in the first 30 days after conception because the eyes and the brain and the neural tube, which the limbs and the spine form from, they all develop in the, in the first 30 days after conception in humans. And the saddest thing that I saw was a little blonde blue-eyed, beautiful toddler girl uh, at Christmas time, and I was on a bus, and I was, I saw her over my my seat. I turned around and saw her, and I was looking at how pretty she was. So I tar- started talking to her babysitter, who was kind of a middle-aged African-American woman, very nice woman. So we were talking, and I said, oh, she's so beautiful, and she was telling me about taking care of her and everything. And she said, she's just my angel. And I wanted to, I didn't want to talk back to back, so I moved in front of her. And I was facing her, and I kept looking at the toddler. And there was something wrong. Um, her, her legs looked kind of like elephant feet. And her arms were very short, and they weren't coming out of her sleeves. And I thought, well, maybe she just needed to have them rolled up. And the woman was observing me. She was very intelligent. She said to me, well, this little girl 
she just sort of, it just came out of her mouth. She said, this beautiful little girl will, um, she will never be taller than she is now because she's a dwarf. The endocrine system is the thyroid uh, gland, the pituitary gland, and the adrenal gland, which is above, it's down in your abdomen, above the pancreas. And those three glands control with messenger molecules that they send all over the body, all the functions of the body. And uh, growth is one of the functions that they control. So obviously damage had been done to her uh, thyroid or pituitary or, or adrenal gland, and um, it was permanent damage because she will never be uh, any taller than she is. And uh, now when I see dwarfs and I see them on television or I uh, think of them, you know, during bomb testing, now I understand uh, what happened to them. They were, they were internally exposed and damaged by ionizing radiation. And the sad thing is we're going to see more and more of this occurring. It's going to expand and multiply through the, um, the, the entire biosphere and all living things in it because now uh, people with radiation damage are breeding with other people with radiation damage and it's multiplying the effects. Uh, a good example of this, cumulative, also the cumulative effect is in cows in England. And cows in England, cattle in England, when they're finished, they don't send them to the, the glue factory. They grind them up and they make cattle feed out of dead cows and they feed them back to the cattle population. Now, what's interesting is anything contaminating those dead cows is going to increase the levels in the living cows. And sure enough, the cattle, uh, then, you know, uh, mad cow disease or por porphyria started uh, being reported in cattle in England, and it kept increasing, and no one uh, was supposed to know what, what the cause was. But the British certainly did know uh, because uh, they were also secretly analyzing the bones of the living cattle with porphyria and taking uh, brain sample uh, tissues and uh, from the dead cattle and Dr. Chris Busby was one of them. He said, we took uh, brain tissue from the dead cows, uh, dead from mad cow disease, and we incinerated it, and then we um, analyzed it for heavy metals, and the brains were loaded with plutonium. And they discovered the plutonium levels were getting higher and higher every year. Some of it could have been coming out of the nuclear power plants, but not that much. It's because they were feeding dead contaminated cows to living cows and just uh, the levels were accumulating in each new generation. And that's exactly what's going to happen here because the whole entire air column, all of our food, our drinking water, uh, the oceans where the fish come, very, very high nutritional value fish have uh, essential oils, too, that we need. And dairy products, everything is contaminated now. And uh, the levels are just going to increase in our bodies and the bodies of our children and all future generations. And um, plants and animals that we eat, the drinking water, and the, um, the surface drinking water is contaminated from rain, water, and snow and, and runoff. Um, but now they're fracking, which is the same thing as BP spraying corrects it all over the, uh, the Gulf and, and, and the East Coast. And the fracking also uses extremely toxic chemicals. We have a surplus of, of natural gas everywhere, so there's no reason for them to continue prospecting for gas. We don't even have enough storage facilities in the United States to store what they're producing. But the producers, the, uh, the gas industry, 
has to keep producing or they lose the leases on the, um, the mineral rights to drill and develop gas wells. So they, they're sort of caught in a hard place. They have to keep producing or they lose their leases, mineral rights or their, their production rights, exploration rights. So now they're poisoning all the, the groundwater, which in uh, many cases is millions of years old. It's extremely pristine, and it's deliberately being poisoned with horrible chemicals. And guess who's doing all the fracking? It's Halliburton, which is owned by Rothschilds, and that is who is poisoning the world. It's the international financiers. They're fracking all over the world. New Zealand, especially all over the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth is the most targeted countries along with the United States. Well, we should be in the Commonwealth, but we're the colony that was not. And uh, the Queen is simply taking back her colony, the United States, and destroying the whole population while she does it. Mutations can be artificially induced in several ways. Back in 1926, working in his lab at the University of Texas, Dr. Herman J. Muller began some new experiments. He set up an X-ray machine in his laboratory. His purpose was to see if mutations could be caused by radiation. He conducted his X-ray experiments on the fruit fly. X-rays can produce some striking abnormalities among the descendants of irradiated fruit flies, nearly wingless flies, flies with extra wings, white-eyed flies. Muller found that X-rays can also have a deadly effect. When he X-rayed fruit flies, a certain proportion of their descendants died as embryos and the eggs never hatched. Scientists have photographed irradiated cells and find that strange things happen. This is a normal cell dividing. The chromosomes split, draw apart, and two new cells are formed. These are cells that have been irradiated. They cannot divide normally. Some of the chromosomes are broken. Some are misshapen. Sometimes the chromosomes fail to split and the cell cannot reproduce. Lighter doses of radiation may cause changes that can't be seen in the chromosomes, apparently by producing changes in the genes themselves. Thus the descendants of irradiated germ cells give us albino corn, distorted ears of corn, and stunted plants. But Dr. Baxter, are all the effects of radiation bad? Most of them are. Therefore, we must be very careful when we use radiation. 